The LD at School team is very pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Terry Ann Jackson, whose presentation this afternoon is entitled Supporting Students with Learning Disabilities in the Differentiated Literacy Classroom. The Ministry of Education has provided funding for the production of this webinar. Please note that the views expressed in this webinar are the views of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect those of the Ministry of Education nor the Learning Disabilities Association of Ontario. We will also be tweeting throughout the webinar, so if you would like to participate, you can send us a tweet by using our handle, at LD at School, or the hashtag LD Webinar. That takes care of housekeeping for this afternoon, so let's get started. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Terry Ann Jackson. Terry is currently an elementary special education resource teacher, also known as a CERT, with the Durham District School Board. With over a decade of experience in programming for students with special needs as a CERT, special education consultant, special education teacher, and mainstream classroom teacher, Terry has extensive experience in differentiated instruction. Assistive technology has been an area of extensive study with a focus on embedding it into the differentiated classroom to support learning for all. Welcome, Terry. The cyber floor is now yours. Thank you, Cindy. Classroom instruction is getting increasingly challenging. The variety of and magnitude of student need in our classrooms can make programming effectively very difficult. Ideally, when students come into our classrooms, we'd like to see them make at least one year's progress during our academic year. This means that we need to, as educators, find a way to support students and ensure that timely and effective interventions are put in place to help students meet their goals. In reading, today we'll discuss that our goal is threefold. It's to build reading fluency, to improve reading comprehension, and to increase motivation for reading. But the challenge is this, classrooms are increasingly diverse and educators are asked to do so much for this huge range of students. How can we do this? One way that I'll be describing to you today is using a reader's workshop model that allows us to inherently support students in applying effective practices in literacy instruction as identified through research in order to support our students. Before we start, I'd love to hear your insights. Cindy, or sorry, yeah, could you please launch the poll? In your classroom, what is the single biggest barrier to delivering the best possible literacy programming? A, resources, B, time, C, knowledge and training, or D, other? Thank you for sharing your thinking. It's interesting that a lot of you find that time is the biggest barrier. I know I too found time was a huge barrier in my classroom, and I do hope that as we go through our webinar today, you'll come across some tools that will help you create more time for yourself during your literacy block. Thank you for the poll. As educators, we consider a number of general categories when we're discussing the supports we put in place for students with learning disabilities. Remember that although many of these practices are essential for our students with learning disabilities, they're also good practices for other learners in our classroom. So please don't think they only apply to students with learning disabilities. Ensure when you're considering your classroom support that you look for the requisite supports in each of the following categories, phonological processing, memory and attention, processing speed, perceptual motor processing, visual spatial processing, 
and executive functioning skills, which includes things like self-regulation, emotion regulation, planning, organization, thoughts, prioritizing, and decision making. The goal of any reading program is to build students who can do four things with text. We would like students who can make meaning of text, meaning that they're able to link it to our world. We like students who are effective users of text, so they know the purpose of text and how to gain information from it. We want students who are code users, so they can identify the features of text. And finally, students who are text analyzers. They have perspectives and they're able to apply higher order thinking skills. To do this, the Guide to Effective Instruction and Literacy discusses the four essential components or instructional strategies for an effective reading program. They are read alouds, shared reading, guided reading, and independent reading. And you can see in my visual on the side that they go from area of highest teacher support to areas of lowest teacher support. Other essential components of an effective literacy program do include oral language development and skill and strategy building of which application of skills is essential for literacy. What I'd like to do now is go through each of these four components and discuss how to use them in your classroom. During a read aloud, a teacher either reads a poem, article, or book to the class while modeling think aloud and reading comprehension strategies. A read aloud should occur daily in your classroom and involves the teacher selecting a book that is typically beyond what a student can read on their own and reading it to them. The purpose of this is to promote a love of reading, stimulate the imagination, and help students develop an ear for the vocabulary and structures of language and print. By allowing the teacher to introduce new reading strategies and to model and demonstrate them by thinking aloud, students are given a floor almost to learn the best way or one of the best ways to start thinking about and working with their text. So how do we do this in our classroom? A read aloud is typically how I start my reading block, either that or with a shared reading. And I often will choose one mentor text for the course of the week or for multiple days, and I'll revisit it looking at different features of that text over multiple days. I do wanna make a note here um, that read alouds can be cross-curricular. So your read aloud time can extend to content areas as it gives you the opportunity to read more text and or to practice my literacy skills in other contexts. So for example, if I have a great book about life cycles and it talks about the impact of a, I don't know, a light, um, removing lily pads from a frog's pond, I could use that in my science program, grade four, and talk about the impact of deforestation and thinking about uh, activating their schema in that way. So why do we do read alouds? I've touched on this a bit, but I just wanted to, to say kind of in greater detail. Read alouds encourage a love of reading by introducing a variety of authors and genres. They introduce children to the big ideas, messages, themes, and concepts found in literature. They build listening comprehension, oral expression, and reading comprehension skills. You're able to model reading fluency. You're able to model think aloud and comprehension strategies. And this is a huge part of why read alouds are so valuable. I often look at targeting one comprehension strategy at a time and diving deep with it. We can also model making good book choices. We can introduce new vocabulary, ideas, genres, and text structures. We can allow students to access text that is beyond their reading comprehension level. And we can also allow students to make connections between topics and ideas across curricular areas. <coughs> when you're planning for a read aloud, some considerations to look at for students with learning disabilities it's first and foremost to ensure that you have preferential seating in your classroom. Oftentimes teachers pull students to carpet for a read aloud. Make sure that you have students in appropriate places. Some students may be best left at their desk. Some students may be best on a wiggly seat. Some students may be best close to you or further away from you or other people in the group. So really consider that. Ensure you always pair your auditory with a visual. I remember someone saying to me in teacher's college that one of the most important techniques I would ever learn is how to hold a book and read it while the students can see it at the same time. When you require responses, always allow students time for processing. Ensure you monitor how long you are speaking for, particularly for students who have working memory challenges. Don't expect them to hold a ton of information at once and apply it. This is also a really great time to be teaching students memory aids, such as mnemonic devices. Ensure you modulate your voice to ensure you can be novel and maintain the attention of students. 
This is a great time to basically specifically teach cognitive flexibility. I look at the perspectives of many different characters and ensure you always take time to activate a student's schema before you begin the read aloud. I'll move on next to shared reading. So shared reading is an interactive experience where a teacher models explicit strategies, building both fluency and comprehension while engaging with students. During a shared reading, students may join in or share the reading of a text. This occurs daily or several times a week and often involves the teacher selecting a chart, big book, or other large print text to read with students, encouraging them to join in with reading when they feel comfortable doing so. Initially, students may join in at familiar repetitive parts of the text, allowing the teacher to model good reading comprehension or reading fluency strategies. Shared reading provides students with essential demonstrations of how reading works and what readers do to construct meaning. It teaches students strategies to decode unknown words and for constructing meaning from text. And finally, the shared reading opportunity allows students to see themselves as readers. They feel comfortable and experience fluency when they join in with the rereading of familiar repetitive text. It provides students with that safe, non-threatening environment in which to practice new and also familiar reading strategies. So why do we use shared reading? This is a great strategy because we're modeling new concepts in order to teach them. And you can see from this image here, this looks like it's a big book. And so the teacher is using a pointer to point out the features of the text that she's hoping the students will see. Now this looks really different across context. For example, it might look like a poem with the new digraph blend that you're teaching. Or it could be a poster, like one from the commercial series Skywriter, in which you teach the features of non-continuous text. For some people, a shared reading includes a choral reading component, but not always. So consider your goals when you're planning your lesson and ensure that the, le the lesson is focused around achieving the goal that you're hoping to, to address. So why shared reading? Shared reading provides rich, authentic, interesting literature that can be used with children even when they are unable to decode the text themselves. It's an excellent way to access concepts that students could not access independently. The teacher is able to teach new concepts, model reading and think aloud strategies, similarly to a read aloud. Awareness of the functions of print, familiarity with language patterns and word recognition skills grow as children interact several times with the same selection. Differentiation is innate in this because struggling readers have scaffolding while accelerated readers are challenged with the selections. And finally, the repeated reading allows learners to interact with the text on multiple levels and the educator can use the same piece of text for multiple purposes. So this not only promotes a growing level of comprehension, but it also promotes fluency. While doing shared reading, some of the considerations you should have when working for or supporting students with learning disabilities is ensure that ins instruction for students with phonological processing challenges by using rhymes or explicitly teaching word patterns and demonstrating how to build the words. Use visual prompts like the pointer on the previous slide to anchor the visuals. Again, continuing to use preferential seating. Use visuals and colors to help highlight um, important information. I often found that I was teaching a new digraph. I like to put a sticky note under that digraph anytime it showed up in our shared reading selection. Keep things really simple and clutter free. For some of our students with dyslexia, spacing a page, there's less clutter, is actually really important to helping them anchor and build fluency with the text. Make sure your instructions are always clear and simple and highlight your learning goals prior to commencing so the students know what to focus on. Again, with that, consider your visual aids, mnemonics, closed activities, and word families so that you're able to support students at multiple entry points. Next, we'd like to talk about guided reading. So during a guided reading session, students have the opportunity to practice decoding and comprehension strategies of text that are presented at either their instructional or independent reading level, depending on your goal of the session. Small groups, typically of no more than six students, are focused on targeted goals. Guided reading occurs regularly during the school week. It involves the teacher selecting appropriately appropriate texts, typically those that students can receive, um, read with 90 to 95% accuracy for fluency building sessions, 
and they may be read quietly or aloud by students in the small guided reading group where the teacher offers support as needed. This gives students an opportunity to use and practice their reading skills. Those skills that we were teaching at our shared reading and read aloud opportunities. It also allows the teacher to monitor individual students' progress. The teacher may need to prompt students to apply their knowledge of reading, or the teacher may need to do some small group instruction during this time. The purpose of guide reading basically is to use opportunities to reinforce previously taught reading skills and strategies. It allows readers to further use strategies to get specific feedback and to consolidate in order to extend their learning. So why do we use guided reading? It allows for targeted intervention. As a teacher, you can create your guided reading groups to focus on whatever skill you are hoping to hone at that point in time. If you have a group of students who need support with fluency, they can be in one targeted group. If you have another group of students who are working on decoding strategies for a certain digraph blend, they can be in another guided group. It allows you to provide immediate feedback and it allows for immediate improvement. It provides an opportunity for rich instruction about literature. It supports the development of literacy skills such as decoding and fluency. You just need to ensure that the level text is appropriate for this goal. It allows students to engage with many genres of text and it provides an opportunity for rich assessment. Teachers readily can identify the strengths, needs and next steps for students. So let's pause for a moment and then launch another poll. Poll question. In order to monitor student progress during guided reading sessions, I track progress using anecdotal notes, complete running records as part of my guided instruction on a regular basis, use rubrics and or checklists completed during or after instruction or other. Interesting, thank you for sharing your thinking. So the bulk of you use anecdotal notes in order to track progress. And I must say that is one of the most common ways I have seen teachers track progress. I tend to find that most people use a blend of different things to support their students. And I'd like to thank you for responding to the poll and thank you for closing the poll. So when you're programming for your guided reading, <clears throat> Some of the considerations to include for students with disabilities are listed below and I'll go through them with you. The first is to build structures to ensure the rest of the class is engaged in meaningful learning opportunities. And this piece here is what we're going to talk about when we get into the Reader's Workshop component of this. Next, ensure you pre-teach all vocabulary. Use strategies like a picture walk to help students activate their prior knowledge and schema before reading. Frequently, progress monitor to ensure that you can check for student comprehension, give short, clear instructions and use nonverbal cues, i.e. pointing and tapping, allow for think time, monitor the duration of your sessions. Sometimes the guided reading books are a little bit longer than student attention span, so know when to break it off and to divide the same book into two sessions. Consider whether oral reading, silent reading, or teacher reading is the best choice based on what your learning goal is. Um, consider using targeted intervention tools. Resources like Reading Recovery or LLI, Level of Literacy Intervention, offer excellent lessons. They scaffold students so that the lessons focus on both fluency and comprehension and rotate. Also determine the purpose of the session and consider the, what text is appropriate. Do you want to build fluency? Are you looking at decoding strategies? Are you looking at working on comprehension strategies? The final component is independent reading. During independent reading, students have the opportunity to apply decoding and comprehension strategies on self-selected reading materials. An opportunity to individually conference with the teacher occurs parallel to the independent reading time. Now, the trick here is this. Independent reading really isn't as easy as you think. 
you really need to focus on building student stamina. If our goal is to get students up to 20 minutes of independent reading time, you need to start with a small amount, like four minutes. And once the class is mastered that, you gradually add time. So during independent reading, you can see here in this picture here, students have chosen how they want to sit. They're chilling, doing their thing. They're reading by themselves with little or no teacher support. The goal is to have them reading for pleasure or enjoyment. So making sure you have a variety of material in your classroom will help students ensure that they're able to be engaged. So why do we use independent reading in our classrooms? Well, because every day students have the opportunity to read self-selected material and the teacher can conference or provide other opportunities to assess and guide student practice. Students learn to choose just right text. It encourages reading for pleasure as well as for information. It fosters independence, and it also provides an opportunity to scaffold learning. Readers build fluency, and then they practice those skills that we've taught them during read aloud, shared reading, and guided reading on their own. So it naturally scaffolds instruction. As with all things, there are a number of considerations we should put in place for our students with learning disabilities. The first one, and the one that's most common for many of us, is to use speech-to-text software. Now, we know that dual modality software reduce, reduces the effort on students to decode so they can focus on the comprehension and improve their, improve their fluency. Some research out of CURS will actually indicate it, that the color scheme that they've chosen benefits students who are ELLs as well as students with dyslexia because it activates two different areas in their brain allowing for deeper comprehension of the text. As I mentioned earlier, really take time to build student stamina. They need the opportunity to get better before they can do this alone. I often spend the bulk of the first six weeks of my school year teaching this, like I teach all of the other routines in my classroom. Consider using different versions of text. Reading independently is not just novel, so encourage variety, have lots of different options available in your room. Consider menus, magazines, things like that. Some teachers actually create a reading menu that encourages students to read a variety of text over the course of the year. However, on that note, know which students will always need your help choosing and make sure you have a discrete place where they can choose appropriate text. The final thing is to really consider the physical structure of your classroom and the other activities that might distract readers. Noise cancelling headphones might be helpful, comfy seating might be helpful, almost sectioning your room into different quadrants might make it easier for you. So thus far we've talked about the four components or the four big instructional core strategies for literacy. The first two, read aloud and shared reading, typically happen whole class. And then you break off into small groups during the second component of your literacy block. And that's when you would either do most of the time your guided practice or your independent practice. What I'd like to spend some time now is showing you how you can create a reader's workshop that will make it more efficient and maximize your opportunities for guided practice during that second component of your course. Remembering that classrooms are challenging and there are so many pieces to consider as you program for students. So providing that learning environment that meet, meets the needs of all learners is very tricky. However, when you build that balanced literacy program and you alternate your, your read alouds and shared reading with that reader's workshop, you're offering the opportunity to maximize your guided reading opportunities, which we know offers us the biggest instructional bang for our buck and keeps everyone interested and engaged. So after your whole group instruction, you can kind of branch off into your small group instruction. Leverage that independent reading skill you built in the first six weeks of school so you can maximize your opportunities for guided practice. What I'm going to share with you today is the Reader's Workshop, which is how I like to organize my time. So you can see my visual here. These are the five components of the Reader's Workshop that I use. They have changed over time and they are fluid, but you'll notice that big and at the center I've put guided reading because guided reading is the single most important thing in my literacy classroom, and so I need to make sure that's my focus. The other components, independent reading, writing about reading, working with words, and digital and media technology are almost like my supporting characters so that I can really, really focus on my guided practice. A reader's workshop can be used kind of as the middle block of your literacy program. It provides structure to the class, and a way to increase the opportunities for you to teach small groups of students. 
most educators work around and try things out until they find a system that kind of works for them. It's important that you investigate various systems and choose one that you think will work best for your teaching profile and as well as your class learning profile. At the bottom of this slide, I screen clipped a variety of systems I found online and there are plenty online. So take a look and see what works for you. Each has its own advantages. Some students need really concrete directing. So the work board on the left hand side tells students the order in which they need to work on things. The exact opposite is true of the one on the far right. That's the daily five, which unless they're at the guided table, students are able to self-select what activity they would like to do. As a teacher, it's important that you know your preference and you choose what's best for your class and each of the individual learners in your class. So this is where things become quite tricky in the beginning because you need to figure out who needs what level of support in order to work best in the classroom. For many students with executive functioning difficulties in particular, the planning and organizing required to self-select requires pre-planning pre and routines. They might need a checklist and or success criteria for each station in order to be able to get themselves there. So ensuring they can initiate with the task and complete them independently will require sufficient scaffolding. At the top of the slide, I've suggested a structure that's worked well for me in my classroom. I've divided my reader's workshop into two halves and I assign students responsibilities for each half of the block. As you can see that on specific days, students have been broken into five groups and they've been assigned two jobs. I switch my groups every six to eight weeks. My reader's workshops are all ability based so I can focus on targeted intervention. I'll spend some time now talking about the potential ways to structure the remaining components of the reader's workshop. Given that we've already spent a lot of time talking about guided and independent reading, I will not speak about them again, but know that they are two of the huge and most important components. The first thing I'd like to talk about is working with words. During working with words, the teacher provides direct and systematic instruction in language and literacy. Individualized programming focus on phonological awareness, phonics, word analysis, and activities vary. The programming is differentiated based on the process, product, and content for each student. So each student has an individualized working with words program. The goal of working with words is to ensure that all students read, spell, and use high frequency words correctly, and that they learn the patterns necessary for decoding, spelling, and word solving strategies. It may include phonemic awareness, letter sound relationships, vocabulary, semantics, syntax, pragmatics, metacognition, comprehension strategies, experimenting with word and spelling patterns, memorizing high frequency words, generalizing spelling patterns, adding to knowledge of words, understanding concepts of prints, examples of things that I sometimes use in word study are things like word sorts, adding words to their word collection, adding words to their word study notebooks, practicing basic words that are often misspelled, open word sorts where the students would create criteria, closed word sorts where I've created the criteria, and opportunities to scaffold the learning that we've done in read aloud and shared reading and guided reading across contexts. During working with words, we want students to systematically learn sound symbol relationships and ensure that they are applied as we scaffold them from reading in isolation, so during working with words, to reading independently. So why do we use working with words? It allows students to engage with literacy in parts. So for a lot of students, learning things in pieces is much more easy than learning things in a whole. It also allows for individualization of programming. It allows for direct instruction of specific skills like word patterns and spelling rules. And it also allows for multi-sensory practice. So we can encourage and incorporate kinesthetic activities into the reading process. Some considerations for students with learning disabilities. Consider using a variety of materials. I love things like wiki sticks and Play-Doh to get students up and engaged. Magnetic letters are another popular one. Ensure that tasks are chunked effectively. You may want to almost create a structured program that progresses and students will find their entry point and you'll move them through it. That will give you an opportunity to make sure that expectations are clear. Consider partner work or mixed ability grouping. But again, this is going to require you teach collaboration, problem solving, and teamwork skills in advance of being able to do this. Ensure that work is presented at the instructional level that is, and is, it's engaging for students. And test out some activities. Ensure students are working at a level that's, that they can both do in terms of language comprehension. And also, take a look at their fine motor skills. Nothing 
derails uh, working with the word session, like having your magnetic letters in a lower C chord tin that can't, no one can get the lid off. May have happened to me once or twice. The next thing to talk about is writing about reading. So during writing about reading, students have the opportunity to articulate their thinking about reading based on the material they've read in class. Students can choose to write about the read aloud, your shared reading, guided reading, or even their independent reading material. The teacher responds to the student by writing a response that meets the student where they are and extends their thinking by using prompting questions. So you can see here, I've, I've incorporated some images. I often will make an anchor chart with my class for when students have a hard time thinking about ideas. And what we do is we glue it right into their reader's notebook and I also post it on the wall of my classroom. I've included an image of a reader's notebook because for many students, writing in their reader's notebook is how they like to, to communicate. And I've also included a dictaphone because once upon a time I had a student who, I knew he had lots of great ideas in his head but they never went out on paper. And so I gave him the dictaphone. He used to pace the halls of the school dictating to me about his reading each week. And then I would dictate back. And it was a beautiful way that really gave me the opportunity to see what he was capable of doing. So remember that when you're generating that list of ideas I talked about, they can be open or focused on specific instructional strategies. So give you may want to almost guide it when you're looking to assess specific skills. And I like to do this regularly. <clears throat> What I found worked best for me is when I had 30 students in my class, I would divide them up so I received six students reading response journals each day, so I, did never, so I never had to respond to 30 kids at a time. That way I could take six home and it didn't feel like too much work to spend, you know, 30 minutes a night writing back to six people. When I wrote back, it was really awesome because it allowed me to differentiate for students on another level. I knew what level of prompting to ask them. I was able to connect with them on a couple of things, and it, it really helped me build rapport, especially with some of the quieter students in my class. So why do we write about reading? Individualization is the real reason why we do this. Readers can write about texts they have read in class during read aloud, share reading, independent, or even guided reading activities. It encourages your readers to practice their comprehension strategies. It requires they look back and take, take a deeper think about things. And individual responses allow the teacher to probe at the instructional level and to connect personally with each student. Now, this tends to be one area where there are a lot of considerations for students with learning disabilities. First, allow students to respond across a variety of forms. So I showed you the example of the response journal and the dictaphone. I've also had some students who like to use post-it notes. Some students like to write letters. Some students like to do oral responses. Some students even like to do it electronically. Make sure students have access to a word bank or word wall. And one of the great ways of organizing it to make it easier for students with learning disabilities to access is to make sure you organize it by increasing complexity. So tools like spell check are really essential in making sure that assistive technology and word prediction software is available as needed. Speech to text software is very helpful for many students. However, ensure they are fluent with the software before you set them on this task. Also make sure you have a nice dictation space in your room and students have good quality noise canceling headphones so that they don't have disruption by other students. Nothing derails um, dictation software like a student who uh, has everybody else's words on the space. You may want to allow students to type and then drag and drop things back and forth just to save them having to retype if they decide to edit drafts. You may wish to create templates and to-do lists to help students plan and ensure students have sufficient time to complete the task. Knowing your students means that you'll know whether they need multiple days to get this letter ready for you each week. And make sure, most importantly, that your success criteria is consistent over the course of the term because it helps to foster routine and students can build their, their comfort as they get through and they learn about this. The next component is digital media technology. So we're living in the 21st century and we all know that everyone's looking to find ways to leverage the digital in their classroom or to get students really engaged in thinking about technology. So with the focus on teaching this, we need students to think critically and learn to navigate this new content online. We talk about the new literacy, so we want them to have chances to interact with their computers, video games, apps, and the internet, not only to make them more interesting and excited in the classroom, but also to support them in becoming fluent members going forward in society. It's important to offer an opportunity to experiment with our literacy skills in this new literacy environment. And the possibilities are endless.
students can green screen summaries, they can do retells of read alouds, they can do podcast author reviews, they can use media tools to do listening to reading like TED Talks or podcasts. Some people actually find it valuable to do direct instruction of typing skills. In fact, there's research that indicates that for students um, to make good use of typing on a computer, they actually need a typing speed of greater than 24 words per minute. Otherwise, the technology may not enhance their learning. So particularly for your students with CF-funded laptops, you may want to consider having typing as something they would do as part of their reader's workshop. So why do we teach this digital media technology as part of our literacy block? Well, first of all, it's in the curriculum, but next, it helps develop critical thinking skills. It helps to understand how media messages shape our culture and society. It recognizes that what the media maker wants us to do or believe. It helps us recognize bias, spin, and misinformation. It helps us evaluate media messages based on our own experiences, skills, beliefs, and values. It helps us to create and distribute our own media message. And it also, thinking bigger picture, allows us to advocate for media justice. Now, these are our really big overarching ideas, but when we think about those being our goals, look at what you're planning for your media technology and look at the new cool app that you've discovered and figure out how can this be supportive for you and your students. In terms of considerations for students with learning disabilities, keep it simple. Always connect it back to the curriculum. What skill is this building? Consider the amount of screen time students are receiving throughout the day. And this is particularly important for our students with CF-funded laptops who use them throughout the day. We want to make sure that technology is enhancing learning, not increasing the level of agitation in students. Make sure you plan a backup in the event that your machines or your internet are acting up and teach students how to troubleshoot and how to determine when to do a backup activity. I always teach this so that students are not surprised. So when I'm teaching my routines in my classroom, I'm gonna say, uh-oh, technology malfunction, what's our backup plan? Again, using checklists and to-dos to help students plan. Ensure assistive software is available and compatible with your chosen tool as needed. And consider fine motor impairments. Are students able to use the aspects of the device that you're hoping they can use? Finally, we're getting to a point where we're looking at how to put it all together. Overarching, there are some considerations we need to put in place when planning a reader's workshop in our classroom. So these aren't tied to one of the individual sessions. This is tied to reader's workshop as a bigger picture. Remember that you want students to have the opportunity to demonstrate understanding in a variety of ways. This includes building routine. Routine means that students know what to expect and how to get through a task. This will free up their cognitive load. So when you're teaching your routine, think about things like teaching how to chunk, teach students how and when to take a self-regulation break, teach them those organizational skills they're going to need, teach them collaboration skills so they can work together and then resolve simple problems. This will also teach you as in um, whether or not collaborative activities are going to be appropriate in your reader's workshop. Also, it allows for assessment to be done over a variety of ways. You can see that because skills are being reinforced in the variety of components of the reader's workshop and through our strategies at the whole class, we've got a number of ways to assess and evaluate our students' learning. Again, I'm bringing up the importance of routines and expectations because that really is what's going to make or break this. You can have the most beautiful reader's workshop in theory, but unless you spend the time to actually put it into place, it is going to be really challenging um, to, to make it work effectively. Consider the level of openness. Do students need the opportunity to choose? Are they better served with a daily schedule? Have all of your materials available and consider setting up a space that is dedicated for each activity. What I found is when I had space challenges in my classroom, I actually had a white bin dedicated to each activity. And before our readers workshop started, the bins came out and they moved to a designated space in the classroom where the, I liked that activity to occur. Build in opportunities for breaks. So teach those problem solving and self-regulation skills for students to use. And finally, consider the transition warnings. Use things like countdown timers to help you plan for the transition and that's so students know when it's starting to become time to wrap up. Some classrooms have used the green, yellow, red signal up on their whiteboard. So there's three pieces of paper and the teacher says, we're in green now, you have lots of time. And when it's getting halfway through, they pull that off so students know from the visual on the board that they're in yellow. And when time is wrapping up, it moves to red so students know to clean up. 
there's a researcher called Kleinberg who actually looked at students with executive functioning challenge and he mentioned two very important things that you needed to set up in terms of your classroom routines. He says, you know, how do you teach that self-regulation? How do you teach the checking, monitoring, prioritizing? And then how do you teach students to do those check-ins while they're self-monitoring? The other thing that he found was very important was teaching those working memory strategies. You need to teach them in a systematic way so students are able to think about them, apply them, and look how they apply across contexts. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me today. I hope that you were able to learn something new. I'm going to give the floor back to Cindy and you guys can take a peek at my references page. Great. Thank you so much, Terry for sharing your knowledge and expertise and providing our webinar participants with some wonderful practical suggestions and strategies to differentiate their literacy programs. Okay, now we're going to move on to the question and answer segment of today's webinar. If anyone has questions, please type your question into the chat box on your GoToWebinar dashboard and I will read your question to Terry. Okay, Terry, first question for you. For students who have learning disabilities, and particularly for those who are reluctant readers, how do you encourage them to participate in independent reading if they are really not interested in using assistive technology and looking different from their peers? Oh, that's a really great question. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I suppose you need to kind of, first of all, carve out why the reluctance. Is it reluctant because they're struggling to decode the text or is it reluctant because they are struggling to find text that interests them. So I think the first thing I would do as a teacher is I would do a reading inventory survey with the students. I would probably do it with everyone and find out the kind of things they're into and make sure I, I go to the public library and check out some books on the topics that they like. For that particularly reluctant reader, I may also speak to their parent and find out if there's anything over time that they've been really interested in. Even if it means bringing the Guinness Book of World Records into my classroom, it's nice to have something that you know that they're going to be engaged with. So I may start there. The next thing that I would do is I would try to find a way to get as many kids as possible, even those who don't need assistive technology, using the assistive technology in my classroom. Potentially, this reluctant reader may end up realizing that assistive technology will be their pathway to success. And we need to make sure they take that time to, to discover that pathway for themselves. So if I have assistive technology available to anybody with a bunch of really great material on it, that would be one way to encourage them. The next would be that I might offer books on tape. So I would have the, um, you can get a lot of the um, Magic School Bus books, for instance, at the public library where you get it on tape. So students would have the opportunity to listen and hear. I may also get my iPod and download some books on my iPod and then students can listen to things that way. If you have access to iPads and you have um, the ability to go online, Hoopla, which is offered through the public library, has a ton of audiobooks. And while audiobooks aren't ideal, they can be listening to the audiobook and looking at the text, or you can use the audiobook as a way to kind of build interest in an author or a topic and then bring other books in from that. I hope that was an answer. Yeah, no, that's actually a great answer, Terry. And I was really pleased to hear you talk about bringing technology and assistive technology into the classroom and having it made available to all students. I think the more as educators that we can provide technology and assistive technology, and some people are actually thinking that it's better to refer to it as educational technology. When we provide it to everyone in the classroom and they have the option to use it when they, they wish to, not just when they need to, it becomes more acceptable and therefore reduces the stigma that might be associated with specialized SIA equipment. Okay, another question here. Is there a place in your reader's workshop model for more intensive interventions, such as tier two, 
for struggling readers or students who have significant learning disabilities that impact reading? Another really great question. So as a teacher, when I'm created, creating my guided reading schedule, what I tend to do is I divide my students up into groups based on ability. So I might have my really super high achieving students and I might see them out of my 10 guided reading blocks that I have timetabled for myself during that period. I may only see them once out of the 10 times during the week. For my students who are needing intense intervention, I may be seeing them three times a week. In other situations, students who are typically developing and I'm not concerned about, I may see them once a week. And my students who are struggling a little bit, my, your, I would say your C type kids, your level two type students, I may see them twice a week. In fact, I had a situation once where I had a student who was struggling so significantly that I managed to find a time to guided read with them every single day for a period of 10 minutes. And what I did was I created a component at the end of my guided or at the end of my reader's workshop where students had, had a fun word-based activity and that allowed me to have 10 minutes every single day to do one-on-one -on -one instruction with that student. But it does require some creativity. Um, other times, now it's going to depend obviously on the structure of your school and your system, but there may be support people who can help you to really dive into those tier two kids. So if you're able to get parent volunteers in your school, they can read with some of your typically developing readers and you can create a script for them that would allow them to guide that guided reading lesson. And as long as you checked in with them on a regular basis, they could do some of that guided reading, allowing you to work more intensely with the students who you as the qualified teacher are trained to work with. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's that's also uh, a great answer, Terry. And I think it uh, you've referenced there the importance of being able to tap into some additional resources, i.e. human resources, who might be available, the parent volunteers, maybe older uh, students within the school who can help support your reading program. Because I'm thinking back to your very first poll when people, the people who participated indicated that time was of the essence and was probably the single most important factor or variable in trying to plan an effective literacy program. Okay, next question here. I'm teaching in an intermediate setting for students with specific learning disabilities. Are the suggestions that you've provided for your readers workshop applicable for intermediate age students? I think they are, but I think you need to take them and, and look at your setting. So I worked with an, an absolutely incredible intermediate teacher who followed a similar model, but what he did was um, his digital, so his, he had the independent reading and the writing about reading components going. He had the guided reading component going, and his word study component was a much more structured literacy based program focusing on some grammar and things that were in his curriculum. And then what he did for his digital and media technology component, he actually had students listening to TED Talks and podcasts. And that's where that idea um, came up. And what he would do is they would listen to the 10 or 20 minute podcast and then they would sit in a small group and then they had a talking tool and they would respond to questions the teacher had suggested they talk about after listening to the TED Talk, and that got them discussing the strategy about reading or working on their listening comprehension strategies. Great. Well, thank you so much, Terry. At this point in time, that's all the time that we do have for questions, so we are going to end our formal question and answer session at this time. Should you have any further questions, please either email us at info at ldatschool.ca or use our hashtag on Twitter, hashtag LDWebinar, and we will ensure your questions get answered. Mark your calendars for the next LD at School webinar on Tuesday, May 8. Dr. Marjorie Phillips, Director at the Center for Mental Health Research at the University of Waterloo, will be presenting Managing Anxiety in Students with Learning Disabilities. After today's webinar, you will receive an electronic link to register for this upcoming webinar. Please also mark your calendar 
and save the date to join us at LD at Schools Fifth Annual Educators Institute, which will be held on August 21st and 22nd in Mississauga. Information on the program, registration, and hotel accommodation will be available on the LD at School website next week. And on behalf of the LD at School team, I would once again like to thank Terry for her presentation and thank you to all of our participants for joining us. Please remember that we will be sending out presentation slides and a short survey following today's webinar. The feedback we receive through the survey provides us with important information for producing future webinars. As a reminder, we will be sending out a link to this recorded webinar in approximately three weeks. Thank you again for participating and enjoy the rest of your day.